when we think of the Netherlands, it's easy to come up with pictures of tulip fields, people wearing clogs, or windmills, something like that. Or even some of its more popular cities like Amsterdam, The Hague, or Rotterdam. But one of its cities that you probably haven't heard of could also be one of its best. In the heart of the Netherlands lies the country's fourth largest city and what was for over a thousand years its most prominent and well known. In 2012, the Lonely Planet rated this city, Utrecht, in the world's top 10 most unsung places. So I thought we'd come down here and check it out and find out why. To learn more about Utrecht, we can go back to the beginning. The very first people to inhabit the area where Utrecht sits today were tribes moving west from Germany at around the year 300 due to the warmer climate. And these became known as the Frisians. The tribes that continued migrating west made it all the way to England and became known as the Anglo-Saxons. So what's interesting about this is that because the Frisian and the Anglo-Saxons originated from the same Germanic tribes, their languages were very similar. In fact, Old Frisian is the closest related language to Old English. Anyway, so as the Frisian population grew, so did its area of control, and it became known as the Kingdom of the Frisians. And it wasn't until the Roman Empire came to their doorstep that their lands were eventually challenged. The name Utrecht comes from the Roman word tractum, which means uh, a crossing or a good place to cross the river. And it was at these shallow river crossings where attacks to the Roman Empire would come from the north. And actually you can think of the river Rhine behind me as like the Great Wall in the, or the North Wall in the popular TV show Game of Thrones. To the north were the wild tribes, the wild links, and to the south uh, of the wall was the vastly superior, much more powerful and wealthy Roman Empire or Westeros. Now, although there was no great wall built here, what the Romans did have was strategic fortifications built along the River Rhine that stretched for over 300 kilometers, which is the northern frontier to their empire. the Limes Germanicus and what would happen is when one of those forts came under attack they would light a smoke signal so a fire and the forts to the left and the either side the left and right would come to their aid problem is in the Netherlands you don't actually have a lot of sunny days so a lot of those smoke signals uh, would unfortunately not be seen and it would be here at this shallow river crossing that the city of Utrecht would start out as a Roman fort and the Romans built this in the year 42 AD. So Utrecht would start out its life as a simple Roman fortification. The walls were made out of wood and it was called a castillum, which means it would hold up to 500 Roman soldiers and some workers and their families. 150 years later, the first upgrade came with the replacement of the wooden walls for stone walls, which were a lot stronger. And behind me, you can see the lines, that metal line here, and the steam coming up is exactly where those Roman walls were first built when the city started out in the year 42 AD. And which is really cool that they've got that here. At night, they get lit up and the steam captures the light so it really feels like you're walking through a wall. But unfortunately for the Romans, the walls weren't strong enough. Continual attacks kept coming from the northern tribes. And in the year 300, the city had to be abandoned altogether. It wasn't for another 300 years that Utrecht would again be mentioned in history. And that was in the years 700 when monks came to this area and built a church dedicated to St. Martin within the ruins of the old Roman fort. 
Unfortunately though, the attacks from the northern tribes kept coming and that church has been built and rebuilt several times. But one thing that did happen that changed the path of the city of Utrecht was one, the leader of those monks by the name of Willibrord was made bishop of the Frisians by the Pope. Having the bishop in the city of Utrecht gave the bishop not only religious power but also political. So Willy Broad and his bishop's successors would become prince bishops, almost like kings. They owned the land and the surrounding lands here so they could charge taxes and grow the city into something else. And that was the catalyst in changing Utrecht from uh, a simple stone church within the ruins of a Roman fort into becoming the religious capital of the country. Utrecht's future looked bright. However, in the year 857, disaster struck when Vikings invaded. They terrorized the people here. They ransacked the city and neighboring surrounds. Even the bishop was lucky to get away with his life. However, as they had the seat of the bishop here, the city would continue to grow after the Vikings left and everything would go back to normal and the city would continue to prosper. In 1122, King Henry V of Germany visited Utrecht and it was on that visit that he granted Utrecht city rights. Now that's a big deal. What it meant is that Utrecht could charge extra taxes, could charge tolls, and could even print its own currency. So this and having the seat of the bishop meant Utrecht was a big city and the future had never looked brighter. bishop do with all of his money? Of course, he built one of the biggest cathedrals he possibly could and one to rival even the best throughout Europe. This is the St. Martin's Cathedral which is the heart of Utrecht. It was built in 1253 when a fire broke out on its predecessor uh, which is a Romanesque style cathedral and it's built on the same site that the monk Willy Broad built his first church dedicated to St. Martin in the year 700. But what's interesting is that the church wasn't actually, or the cathedral wasn't actually built by money from the Pope or money from the Bishop. It was paid for by believers. Let's say you committed a sin or you wanted to commit a sin. Then you could go to the priest and you could pay him to have your sins absolved. Cha-ching! Or on the other hand, uh, if you wanted to make a donation to help build the new cathedral, you could get up to a year and 40 days less in purgatory and go straight to heaven. So it's no wonder with an offer like that, that the cathedral ended up being so big. In 1254, the first stone was laid for the construction of the new St. Martin Cathedral. But due to the size of the project, it would take another 300 years before what was to become the icon of the city of Utrecht would finally be completed. the altar in the Dom Cathedral lie the hearts of two kings who both died in Utrecht. The first was Conrad II, his emblem on the left and on the right, King Henry V. 
the word for cathedral in Dutch is Domkirk and the locals call this place Dom Square and behind me you can see the dominating Dom Tower. This is the heart and center of Utrecht and its pride. It's been here standing in the center of town for the last 632 years but fortunately for the lack of tourists that come here you can still climb the 465 steps all the way to the top. So I'm going to go and give it a go. Walking to the top. It's quite an effort. It's getting really thin now, so it must almost be there when you get a glance out the window like that. You realise how high you are. It's quite nervous. This building's been standing here for over 600 years. We made it. All the way to the top. So it would have to be the best view in the Netherlands. On a hot summer's day in the year 1674, meteorologists believe a once in a thousand years storm struck Utrecht. The force of the storm was so powerful that within just a half an hour, the city of Utrecht had been reduced to ruins. The damage was enormous. The Dom Cathedral also sustained major damage. The nave had collapsed entirely. Miraculously though, the 112 metre Dom Tower, although on its own, and no longer connected to the cathedral, had survived unscathed. Even its weather vane on the tower's peak was left untouched. The city had to rebuild, and for that, Utrecht had God on its side. Ever since the 7th century, when monk Willie Broad first came here and built his church dedicated to St. Martin in the ruins of the old Roman fort, Utrecht has been a religious capital. But not just here, in the world. To give you an idea of Utrecht's religious importance, in the year 1522, Utrecht's Bishop Adrian was elected as Pope. He was the first ever elected Pope that wasn't born in Rome, that wasn't Italian essentially. And it wasn't for another 400 years after Adrian that another non-Roman or non-Italian Pope was elected, and that was John Paul II. Behind me is the house of Adrian, where he lived as Bishop in Utrecht. Amsterdam isn't the only city with cool old canals. That's right, Utrecht has them too. This is the older Krach and it's over a thousand years old. Rivers were the main form of transport back in the day and these canals were constructed to allow the goods to be transported along the rivers right into the heart of the city. And the reason Utrecht prospered so much from this form of transportation is because it was on the bend of the River Vecht and the River Rhine. Both of those rivers connected Europe east to west basically, so all goods would come through Utrecht. And the unique part about these canals, which you don't see in the canals of, of uh, Amsterdam, is that they have this lower level platform, and that made it unloading goods even easier straight into the warehouses you can see behind me. If these walls could talk, they would tell you some stories. Ever since the year 42 AD, Utrecht's been under siege, whether it be from the, the Vikings or from the wild tribes to the north of the Roman Empire, from the Spanish, from the English, from the French, uh, even the Germans. 
it's really been a city under siege and these are some of the ancient walls you can still see here today that were formed part of its defense against these uh, attackers. In uh, 1528, Charles the V uh, asserted his domination of his empire over Utrecht and took away the powers of the bishops. Obviously the bishops weren't too happy about that, so they formed a rebellion and some uprising uh, with the people. And what they did was, uh, the, the Spanish, King Charles to assert his domination in the area, he built a castle called Brandenburg Castle right in the heart of Utrecht. And he put a, a garrison of his troops in there to quite quell the rebellion and keep control of his, of his newly uh, acquired empire, so to speak. And what the, but what the bishops did is they formed an alliance with the surrounding uh, provinces. And this is known as the Treaty of Utrecht. And the foundation of this treaty would be later what would become the of the Netherlands as its own sovereign country and it was the leader the first leader of this uh, treaty named William the first of Aranya and his ancestors are today the royal line of the Netherlands the king and queen descendants and Aranya being orange that's how you get the Dutch national color of orange when they wear it around there uh, their sporting events and things like that. Battle broke out and eventually the, the Spanish were uh, defeated by the, by the new alliance of the Dutch. And although Vrendenburg Castle here was abandoned without fault, the Spanish just left it. The Dutch destroyed it here, so you can still see the ruins, but they destroyed it for fear that the Spanish would come back. Sadly though, after the alliance won their victory, they didn't like the independence that Utrecht had. So they took away its bishopric powers and that would uh, put Utrecht as a city on a downward spin into obscurity which is the start of why it's lesser known today than what it was for the past 1500 years. More bad news would come for Utrecht in the year 1672 when King Louis XIV of France invaded with 120,000 troops. He demanded 500,000 guilders as a payment for not looting the city. This put the city of Utrecht on the verge of financial collapse. hundred years later and again the French would invade Utrecht. This was at the hands of Napoleon. Napoleon gave his brother Louis uh, the seat of uh, king here and this is where he lived and it wasn't until 1813 when Napoleon was defeated that the French would leave and the Kingdom of the Netherlands would look after Utrecht once again. But Utrecht had one more invasion. The Germans invaded pretty much at the start of the war is one of the first cities that they took over, being that the Netherlands is next door to Germany and it wasn't until 1945 uh, when the Alliance won that the Germans led the city and now it's back in the hands of the Netherlands Kingdom once again. You would think with all its history, its museums, medieval churches and Roman ruins, the picture postcard streets and canals with our fresco bars and cafes sitting along them, a city with the magnificent Dom Tower at its heart, the tallest in the country, having been the capital city for over a thousand years, would make Utrecht high on any visitor's must-see list for the Netherlands. Instead, you wouldn't be alone if you hadn't even heard of it. And the reason? is the Dutch Golden Age of the 1600s. It was during this period in history that the prominence of the city of Utrecht was put well in the shadows of its neighbouring seaside city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam was at the heart of the Dutch Golden Age, where unimaginable wealth poured in via ships carrying spices and materials from all four corners of the world. Vast amounts of wealth and power put Netherlands on the world map and Amsterdam as its new capital with it. Amsterdam became the most important trade port as well as the financial capital of the world. And that's why Utrecht, like yesterday's hero, once the country's most prominent, powerful and important city is today all but forgotten. That is until you come down and rediscover Utrecht for yourself, which I highly recommend you do.